Good afternoon, good morning, welcome wherever you are calling in from. We have participants joining at record speed today. We're so pleased to have a phenomenal lineup of speakers, panelists, and an enormously rich discussion ahead of us today. We have three segments in our program. We're going to start with a presentation, an overview of the history of the tool and the value for her Connect platform. The second segment will be with our development partners and speaking on behalf of the community of development and the vision for women all over the world, women businesses, women in agriculture and women in Africa particularly. And our third segment will be our formal handover and launch for which we're very, very pleased and honored to have our the leaders of both organizations, uh, Legacy CTA handing over to Agra. So this is going to be an extremely dynamic, exciting program ahead of us. And we're so grateful that all of you could join us. I see that many attendees are still joining and logging in, but because our time is so precious, and I know women are multitasking all over the world, eager and clamoring to finish three things before they start four more things and round out their extraordinary lives and days. So today, I think we should remind ourselves, we just had last week um, the Rural Women's Day, and we were celebrating rural women around the world and thinking today about Value for Her Connect the importance of women and agribusiness around the world. We think um, from a perspective of Africa and from, from where I sit in Agra, we're thinking about women entrepreneurs as the linkage between smallholders and consumers. And we're thinking more and more over the coming year about the food systems vision and approach. Women are networkers, they are absolute fighters, drivers, every day striving to make their communities a better place. And yet, despite all of this effort and striving and struggling and fighting, we still have tremendous inequities. And we know the challenges, not just in times of COVID, but the challenges of women entrepreneurs around the world. It's been proven time and time again that there's gaps, both in profitability of women entrepreneurs, profitability gaps of 34%. There are land ownership gaps where only 13% of women in Africa have title to land, 25% joint title. Gaps in access to finance for women entrepreneurs. Productivity gaps for, for women farmers, 20 to 30% productivity gaps. And we know that every time there is any ambiguity or inequities or even uh, challenges that gender-based violence goes through the roof. So today, we don't want to talk about barriers and difficulties only. We want to talk about opportunities. We want to talk about new platforms, tools, ways where women can use networks, use mentorship, use tools to grow their businesses. We've seen so many opportunities for additional funding resources, financing resources, blended finance for entrepreneurs to take advantage of and overcome the struggles that they have. And so while we are aware and absolutely fighting every day alongside all of the women entrepreneurs who have used this tool and will continue to use it in the future, we know so well, that without these extraordinary opportunities to connect, the women entrepreneurs that we support really struggle and struggle and struggle to grow. So with this, I'm very pleased to introduce Sabdi Odido, who is the, the godmother of this tool and her brainchild. She has joined Agra only two months ago, um, and we're so pleased she joined as our head of gender and inclusiveness. And Sardio is going to present the, the Value for Her Connect tool, and then we'll hear from each of our panelists on the first of three segments today. Sardio, over to you. Thank you very much, Vanessa, and good afternoon, good morning to our audience, and thank you very much for joining us. 
I'm going to share a very short pitch on the value for her platform and uh, uh, the opportunities that this platform has for women entrepreneurs in agriculture. Uh, Vanessa has painted the bigger picture, but just to revisit the headline figures, uh, uh, for for agriculture, we know m women are majority in uh, agriculture in agriculture sector in Africa. It is the largest employer uh, uh, employment sector in Africa. But uh, we know that there are there are struggles, there are challenges, and and because of challenges, for example, around access to productive resources and and services, women's uh, productivity gap is at 20 to 30 percent compared to the male farmers. Now, when you get to the business end of 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 agriculture, and Vanessa has again shared this headline figure, uh, the recent evidence from the World Bank study that was done for Sub-Saharan Africa for 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 businesses in Africa, uh, the the profitability gap between uh, f women led businesses and male led businesses is up to 34 percent, and this is attributed to a couple of uh, constraints constraints around access to uh, competitive markets uh, there is uh, the study clearly highlights that there's tendency for women uh, to choose sectors and markets that are not very competitive that are fairly easy for them to navigate to get into and to operate within and because of this uh, then the uh, the, the the chances to grow their businesses to to reap benefits from uh, the um, uh, the pro uh, profitable end of agricultural value chain is limited. Uh, the, the issues around access to finance, this is again key, and uh, this is underpinned by, a num underpinned by a number of other issues, access to land. Land is not only a, a factor of uh, production, it's also an asset to leverage for, for business investment and for accessing capital. So this is again another constraint, but other constraints also around networks, uh, information, market information, information confidence and capabilities to navigate and lead businesses in more complex markets. We know agriculture markets tend to become more and more complex as you move along the value chain because uh, one, the products get more uh, diversified but also sophisticated. It's food, there are rules and regulations that govern entry of food products, food commodities, for example, in different markets. So this is so crucial. This information, this knowledge, this intelligence is so crucial. So the value for her platform was constructed as a digital resource that is bringing together all the different needs uh, for women uh, in uh, uh, in accessing. Uh, in growing their businesses and putting their businesses on the pathways for growth and profitability. And uh, this, of course, this initiative was de developed under CTA's uh, Value for Her program, together with partners uh, AWAN Africa and AWIF. I'm glad that they are on this panel. Uh, there is uh, 600 women businesses on this platform at the moment. And uh, the businesses, of course, are, 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 are in different areas. Some some are in processing, some are in service, some are just barking and 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 selling and off taking. Uh, now there 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 are a couple of things that this platform addresses. One is visibility of women businesses. There there has been there has always been an issue of where are these women businesses and how do big businesses global agri-food sector, for example, engage with with women. Now here they are. This platform gives every woman's business a profile a visibility an address a contact a face to reach out to this is one the other one is it actually uh, ass assists women to access the the three key capitals that is needed for business growth one is the business capital essentially access to finance and markets the other one is the social capital which is essentially networks and and ability to reach out to to either the market or to themselves to be able to weather the social norms and gender constraints that they go through and the third one is the knowledge capital essentially the information the market information business intelligence that is needed for them to to get into into new markets and to succeed and it really gives an opportunity for business to business matchmaking for networking but also is an instrument for building advocacy voice 
for women and indeed gives an opportunity uh, to organize, to mobilize and to support, to, to support women in a more uh, structured, uh, structured way. So uh, for now, there are 600 businesses. The channel for uh, agri-food company uh, registration is going to be open soon. The channel for financiers will open soon and the channel for technical service providers will open soon. So what does this uh, uh, platform offer? It offers women agripreneurs visibility, uh, it offers access to buyers, it offers access to financiers, but it also offers access to information on, on different trade opportunities that are out there. What does it offer agricultural commodity buyers? Women businesses that are ready and, 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 and ready for a sustainable business relationship. This is what the platform offers. What does it offer financiers? It offers businesses that have been rated, women businesses that have been rated, star women businesses ready for investment. And the development community, it offers a verifiable uh, community of women in, in ARC, uh, underpinned by data, underpinned by evidence, and the possibility to build knowledge and experience of what works in terms of supporting women's entrepreneurship and growing uh, women's businesses. So indeed, it is something that brings all of us together. It really is an attempt to, 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 to sort of create a more equal landscape, but on a digital space, because digital does offer us this opportunity to be able to do this. So, um, uh, so there are different features, as I said, uh, women to women uh, feature, where the women uh, chat and uh, share information among themselves. There's a women to market pillar, where the buyers and suppliers can actually reach out to women, women can reach out to them. There's women to finance pillar, and there's a knowledge resource pillar. Um, so the, in brief, this is the short pitch around the platform. I ask you to please uh, go to the link register and see what resources are there and particularly if you are a woman entrepreneur you're welcome to join in if you're buying agricultural commodities in in africa we welcome you to join in if you're looking if you're a special purpose investor looking to invest in women we invite you to join in and if you're a development partner that has an interest in supporting women we invite you to join in thank you very much Thank you so much, Sabdio, and we're all uh, busy logging in. I think everybody has seen and we'll send around a link for all of you to be able to circulate to at least 10 of your closest women entrepreneur friends and colleagues. So from here, I would like to uh, turn to Eva, and Eva has um, uh, every day the, the experiences and the struggles of, of growing her own business, Zadeva Fisheries. Uh, and Eva, online today, there are 200 partners from around the world, colleagues, other women entrepreneurs, development experts. Um, what can you say, three um, things from your experience, which will really lead to growing women entrepreneurship and how you can use platforms like this, networking and mentorship opportunities? to grow your business further. Can you give us a, a flavor of what it's like to be walking in your shoes? Over to you, Eva. Thank you, Vanessa, for the opportunity. Greetings, everyone. Um, well, it's uh, quite has been an interesting journey uh, to start off, but I would first introduce myself, of course. Um, I am Eva Shikatara, and then I am the founder and the CEO of Sadeva Fishery Products. So we are based in Namibia. We do supply, we aggregate and uh, process seafood and also freshwater fish products. So basically what had happened, so I would actually start because COVID is so instrumental in framing our business nowadays and that's what everybody is talking about. And my challenges, I'm sure many women are sharing with me too, is the fact that, um, well, um, that COVID, closed um, led me to actually lose 80% of my income in the first month of the lockdown in Namibia. And due to the fact that um, most of the hotels and the rest and the supermarkets I was supplying closed down or have to scale down due to logistical issues. And uh, that is obviously the same in other places. Um, and then so we had to close our operation for one month trying to re-strategize. 
So uh, during this time, we decided actually to go digital, uh, to go digitally, and this is also uh, with the help, obviously, of resources uh, through Value for Her Connect and Awan Africa, of which I am a member of and uh, championing blue economy. So uh, with this information uh, and knowledge, and uh, it helped us to actually get online. We decided to intensify our digital marketing. Uh, that helped us with this period to actually see a 20% increase in our income generation per month. So with this also we reached out and during this time we saw that we have gained synergy from uh, various people from different locations across uh, Southern Africa. So we have been speaking to people, to potential clients in Zambia, for instance, we've gotten two clients that we, I mean potential clients that we are still speaking to um, up until the borders are open and seeing how we can actually further the business transactions. And plus, uh, back home, we also, um, I think, branched out into focusing on the end user consumers and then also um, diversify, diversify our range of products that we are offering. So mainly we were just first focusing on the hospitality industry. But uh, with COVID, we have to look at alternatives. And then we started offering um, end user consumers. And then with this, we also see gain momentum. And then we reached out to women in rural areas who we were supplying, uh, who we could supply fishery products. So we gained uh, 10 uh, women are actually working in the rural setup. So I think with digital platforms like this can actually offer women an opportunity, great opportunity to actually do trade and also sharing information because my challenge is today, what I'm sharing with you is the same experience you're experiencing, but sometimes you don't have the solution for it. But having to meet and network with other women, you can actually gain and uh, find solutions to your problem. And also sometimes nice to have somebody actually listen to you who you can relate to. So I think from our experience, this is, is really quite great. I think looking at access to market, it's also something that can help you with and platforms like this. And I think um, knowing that we cannot solve uh, rural challenges without actually digitalizing um, women in rural areas. So this is very important. And I think with this few remarks, I would say thank you. Thank you so much, Ava, for sharing a snippet of the struggles. Of course, COVID has disrupted every supply chain on the continent. And, and, uh, and as you mentioned, fisheries are already <clears throat> under stress and challenges with the, the changes in uh, climate uh, as well as weather patterns. And with that, actually, uh, I would like to ask Beatrice to share a bit of her own experience as a women entrepreneur and building the network, which Awan has phenomenally built over the years to grow, as mentioned, Ava, the voice of women, and also to raise the visibility of the policy gaps. So over to you, Beatrice. Um, thank you, and hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I really would like to um, say thank you to Mama Value for her, because this is how we fondly called Sabio when we started and that the project that she mentioned that we were doing, um, we're implementing alongside with Andri and uh, for a week. And really when we started, it, 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 her experience that, um, I remember when we were in the room here in Nairobi, it's her experience and her, her passion to the work of the women that really, uh, uh, made us believe that you know we were going somewhere, and that initiative was really very commendable. Again, I remember last year when we were uh, looking um, uh, for a home for for this project value for her, and uh, we were saying, I mean, this is a good initiative, and I'm really glad that the new home is Agra because Vanessa. We always meet in, in many, many meetings, always, you know, echoing each other, like one start, one, one start a sentence, the other one finish the sentence. So, so really, you know, go as they say, those who believe or not believe, God is good always. I'm very happy that the new home for Value for our Connect and that Mama Value uh, Connect will continue in a state that all of us are really in. So this is actually, I think, um, I think um, energy for us 
yeah so to be able to even uh, create a greater impact yeah when it comes to voice and agenda i'll not repeat uh, what um um uh, uh Sabir has said but i want to say that um, uh eva our champion uh, in blue economy she's among the four percent of our 2,500 members who really managed to adapt her business into digital because they're young, she's knowledgeable. And just to summarize what Sabio and Vanessa were to say, that lack of access in digital profession, I mean, it, it's, it's huge. And that's the challenge that all of us here, we are facing, yeah? So this is something that we have to dedicate our efforts, our resources to create more impact. And we all know, Eva and others we have many others in, in, in other countries. She's part of the trailblazers. They survived because they already had decided the level of education they are had determined how they adjusted. But most of our young people, the startup, the one, uh, Sabio, remember the one and the, uh, and the 20,000 who are startup, they are young, they are digitally, digitally knowledgeable, but they have no access to land and no access to capital. How do we uh, formalize them? How do we? How do we um, uh, uh, capitalize them? How do we syndicate and create a fund for startup? Not only training, not only doing this, but you know, intentionally we link our intention to action. I think this is a good platform. I think this is where we, we, we continue. For, for me, it's not starting, we are continuing, but COVID has changed our way of, of thinking. I think we all reset and we are restarting, but in a better way, yeah? So what, what, what I want to say to add to this is that um, as, we, as an entrepreneur, you know, uh, entrepreneur, they, they take risk, yeah? So you, you, you have a problem, risk is always an opportunity. And really COVID has come with a lot of opportunities because it highlighted the gaps that we had along the value chain and supply chains. When we looked at, at, at even short distance supply chain, we're affected. And we really found that from our survey that even those really, we could not even we address them. Actually, we have a big problem in accessing local markets, let alone the regional markets, when it comes to standards, when it comes to safety of the food, even the transport, the transportation of it is not even safe. So really COVID, you know, COVID has been in any way, a big wake up call of like, hello, what have you been doing? So even when it comes to long distance, Forget about long distance because they were all disrupted. You know, cross-border trade was not even there. It's not even there, it's dead. We have to start again. But it's even an opportunity because we are going to restart on a good, on good basis, yeah? And we, we understand about the issue of bulking. So we, as we look into our, our networks, we will look into issue of processing and bulking because that was a challenge. And, uh, and when it comes to market access, I think one of the, most important gain is the Africa free trade area that is going to be in place in January. Now, if we cannot trade in a local market, how are we going to access that market? It's no longer about availability of market, that's no longer an issue on the continent, is how do you access that? How do we prepare of all the, 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 the evidence data that, uh, that Dio has uh, uh, said, and we know those data is evidence, you know, women lag behind on every of each value chain. Yeah. So how are we going to prepare the women who are lagging behind in, te in terms of access, on financial literacy, on market access, on trading? They can't even if you cannot trade in your local market. How do you trade in your trading blocks or in Africa? Area? So this is really where we're going to continue working together. And as an entrepreneur, I say. We, the women, we have to really focus a lot of time, a lot of training, a lot of financial access to the women in agribusiness. I will end it there. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Thank you for reminding us that Africa is actually a huge market and the opportunity to grow is phenomenal. Uh, and we have so much to do to, to harmonize trade across borders and really take the opportunity that the African continental free trade area is going to leapfrog us forward. And we don't want any woman to be left behind. Irene, can you invite us, tell us what you're doing and remind everybody the importance of transitioning from capacity building 
to actually growing businesses. Let's hear about your perspective. Thanks, Irene, from AWF. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, thank you, um, Agra. Thank you, CTA, uh, first of all, that uh, made it possible for us to implement um, this program, Value for Her. Uh, it was there we are two exciting years. And um, I'm particularly very happy that um, Value for Her Connect uh, found a natural home at Agra. It couldn't have uh, gone uh, better as a solution. So um, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, the platform um, is so something needed. Uh, digital is um, where um, is all happening. Uh, COVID has also made it uh, evident for us that uh, technology is key because we have all seen that everything moved to technology. Whether it's education, business, health, we all have to move to technology. And it's not going to stop because it can only um, continue to get better. And um, before COVID, and even now, women are marginalized in terms of um, access to um, technology. So having a platform, a technology platform that can help to um, bridge all the, all the you know, uh, challenges that we see, which is, um, first of all, networking, okay? getting them together, peer-to-peer -to -peer networking that is a powerful tool for them, showcasing them and um, their businesses, facilitating access to finance, access to market. So uh, at, at AWIF, this is what we do, okay? We try um, to identify those challenges and then we design programs you know, to work around them. We have um, accelerator programs, we have um, incubation programs, then we have uh, financial uh, in, uh, investment readiness uh, programs. When, whether you are in agriculture or in any other sector, the challenges are the same, the needs are the same. Um, like you have uh, correctly mentioned, African Continental Free Trade Area is a game changer. It's um, a great opportunity. It's going to unleash opportunities. Opportunities. And how do we get women, you know, to leverage them to better from those opportunities? Is by preparing them and having, um, giving them opportunities to have access to digitalization. Because the digital economy will drive also that um, intra-Africa trade. E-commerce is um, a great place to be, a great uh, skill to to have. Uh, because a lot of that trade will be happening via e-trade, intra-Africa. So um, the platform, I, th I hope uh, you know, there will be opportunity to continue um, trying to provide you know, design solutions that will help women to access more technology as much as possible, digital skills, e-commerce skills, and also to see how to devolve those um, solutions to women in the um, in um, in in rural areas because we know that the cultural activities in Africa is a pro um, essentially in the hands of women and also a good um, part of those women are in rural areas so that uh, dig the digital solutions must be able to also reach women um, in rural communities who are in, agri in agriculture so um, I'm glad to be here once again. And um, at AWIF, we are rolling out programs. We have uh, currently um, a program for e-commerce that we are implementing. A lot of those women are from agribusiness because they are in retailing, and some of those products can also go um, via e-trade. So um, that is it. Thank you again um, for, for the opportunity to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Irene, for your inspiring and commitment comments and all the work that you're doing across uh, Africa and in Nigeria. Uh, we're going now to our second panel segment. So the first panel can close their videos and we'll ask for Dihi, uh, uh, Vicky Wild, and Jim Barnhart to join us now. Um, we also have possibly Esther Dasanu who would join us from the African Development Bank. Let us get started with you, Ndihi, from 
from where you're sitting, UN Women has such a role to play, has really stepped up to, to galvanize support across Africa. And um, we really uh, see um, more and more, and if you can just underscore what you see as the potential for building networks for women in ag and across the food system. Over to you, Ndi. Thank you very much, Vanessa, and hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting you and women to this important handover. It's very timely. Um, my name is Nidhi Tandon, and I uh, speak on behalf of the regional office of UN Women, which is based in Nairobi. Uh, we work with 13 countries from Ethiopia all the way down to South Africa. And I'll start by saying, you know, we recognize that um, women are vulnerable to risks, uh, and yet the flip side of the coin is that they're absolutely vital to recovery. And this is not just in light of COVID, but of course now that is um, the main the main frame, as it were. Um, I'm going to just say five things at this point. Number one, UN Women has and continues to invest in a series of econometric studies on the costs to national economies of the gender gap in agriculture. And um, we're just about rolling out two more studies in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. And the studies have one glaring common finding, which is that there is a direct correlation between investing in women and lifting people out of poverty, which, as you know, is the mandate of UN Women. I'll leave it at that. These studies are available. We are using them to advocate for policies because, of course, that's our, our mission. And uh, everything that everybody just said about land, productive assets, social protection, this is all part of that game plan. But also UN Women um, is very proactive in um, promoting uh, procurement policies that uh, positively discriminate for uh, women-owned businesses. You may also have heard of our, our compact with UN Global Compact on um, women's empowerment principles, but we can revisit that another time. So UN Women does a lot of work on all sorts of aspects which boil down to the empowerment of women. The second thing I'll say is that uh, COVID has shown us a number of things. It has shown us our resilience and it has shown us our fragility and it has definitely exposed for us the inequities in the systems that we work in. But what it has done too, it has redefined for us who the essential workers are, not necessarily the uh, the floor stock mark, stock broker, uh, but definitely the care worker. And um, it has also reframed which businesses are risky. So, so interesting to listen to, um, uh, I think it was uh, our Eva from Namibia, uh, and she was saying, you know, she had to pivot away from her hospitality side of the business to actually feeding people. And so the, the sectors that have really suffered are uh, the front line of hospitality and tourism. And yet uh, the one essential product that continues to export no matter what is food. Why? Because food is an essential business. And so our perceptions of risk, our risk in terms of seasonality, in terms of climate change, in terms of access to assets, is, is sort of put aside now because banks and financiers are going to have to rethink that, oh, no, hang on a second, food is an essential service. So not only are women underpinning care and stewardship, they're feeding us, right? Um, so that's the second thing, that COVID actually helps to expose and bring these things to the fore and, and, and and get us to understand again what is really important. Uh, three, I talk about the networked economy because this is still something that um, continues to uh, evade us and yet COVID could be the accelerator and I'll come back to that in a minute but 80% of the food we eat on the continent is produced by smallholders and therefore working with them through mobile phones, through digital finance, providing them early warning systems, uh, harvest calendars, as well as financing them in commercial value chains. All of this is one circular economy, isn't it? And there has to be, certainly in an African context, and, and we see this with our colleagues who just spoke, 
that there have to be the intermediaries between groups of women, clusters of women, cooperatives of women and men, uh, and the platforms that um, they may not have direct access to, but indirect access to. And this is what we mean by a networked economy, that in fact, there is so much we need to be doing. And I was just thinking as well that on the continent, we tend to be a little uh, sort of Anglo-biased, whereas we have so many other languages, right? And it'd be great to see uh, Value for Her Women um, actually having a French side to the platform and then and then other main main languages like Kiswahili, for we instance. We take but... your challenge up here, here. Bien <laughs> sûr, madame. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, no problem. Oui, oui, oui. I'm going so to have to cut it short. Oh, well, <laughs> let me just say one more thing, uh, which is the digital divide. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the use of the internet for business pur purposes, especially amongst SMEs, is 7% on average, 7%. And the population coverage for 4G networks in Southern uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is 53% compared to 78% in Eastern Europe, and I, I won't go beyond that, but just to say, we need to use the internet for business purposes, yes, and COVID could be the accelerator because in China, when 2003 uh, SARS happened, it triggered a whole set of remodeling what economic uh, transactions would look like, right? And I do think that COVID-19 could become the accelerator to fast track and close this digital divide and by it's a chicken and egg situation. We're never get all. It's all going to be this kind of cascading thing. So we do have to have the platform up and ready, but we do also have to have the IT service providers jumping in and making sure this works. Thank you. It's so interesting because CTA actually published a fantastic report on digital ag last year, and we can certainly yeah. circulate that yeah. link as a reference because it does talk about the issue of scaling digital solutions. Yeah. Um, but I think this is a great lead to Vicky Wild. Let me just let you, Vicky, talk a little bit about all the scientific analysis and research you've been doing at the Gates Foundation, as well as your own personal struggle for the voice of women in ag in Africa. So over to you, Vicky. Oh, well, thanks, and hello, everybody. Um, let me start by expressing my hearty congratulations to Agra for adopting the Value for Her platform, um, supporting Africa's first women in agribusiness digital marketplace is exciting and important and, um, and forward-looking. Um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we too have prioritized women's market inclusion in the agriculture sector. And in this work, we aim to support women's equitable participation in the emerging market opportunities and their equitable value capture. And we all know this is a challenge that most women in agriculture today are stuck in a low productivity trap. You know, all the unequal access to productive inputs and advice, financial services and market information. These all result in very low returns on her labor. In Nigeria, for example, in our research, we're finding that even as more women than men are moving off the farm and into entrepreneurship, women's incomes are not improving. So in our programming, we are focused on two key outcomes. The first is we aim to increase rural women's incomes. And the second is we aim to increase her decision-making over the benefits of that income. And the beauty of this kind of economic empowerment approach with a focus on women is that it has huge spillover effects. Directly, these kinds of interventions reduce poverty and increase food security, but indirectly, they encourage women to expand their sense of self, and challenge the unwritten rules that say women may be lesser than men. With the COVID-19 pandemic, this work has become all the more urgent. For one thing, the jobs most at risk are in food processing, services, and distribution, disproportionately affecting women workers. And women-operated businesses particularly face the intersecting difficulties of scale and the gendered challenges that amplify their vulnerability. 
women are more likely to run informal, micro, and small businesses in the low return sectors than men. A World Bank gender diagnostic that we funded in Ethiopia, for example, finds that women managed businesses in Ethiopia have lower sales turnover, limited access to credit, and are less likely to use hired labor. And today, with the COVID-19 pandemic, has further widened the gender gap in their business earnings. So while all firms have experienced a drastic de decline in their sales turnover, the dip appears to be more severe in women-owned businesses. They've generated less than 20% of the sales revenue they had earned in the same month the year before. In other words, this pandemic is not only biological, it is also social. It's exploiting our pre-existing conditions of our society. It's exploiting the systemic racism, the systemic sexism, the poverty and the hunger in the same way that it exploits the pre-existing conditions of our bodies. And this crisis is threatening lives and livelihoods, especially women's. And so to fully recover from this pandemic, our leaders must respond to the ways it's affecting men and women differently. And if they don't, they risk deepening this crisis and rebuilding a world with all the same social cracks and economic fault lines as the one before. So what do we need to do? Among other things, what are needed are platforms like Value for Her to strengthen women's business networks and business performance through facilitated learning and links to buyers. Digital platforms that offer online trainings and mobile financial services are needed urgently. A few examples of what we're learning about, about what women in agribusiness need include innovative opportunities for building credit history. Alternative means of screening female applicants are needed since women-led businesses typically have less access to physical capital and credit history. And there's promising new research on psychometric testing, screening, and using bill payment histories to predict a credit score. What they need are mobile payments. Transferring money directly to the mobile wallets gives women more control over how a loan is used. In Uganda, women who received loan disbursements in their mobile money accounts were able to control how that loan was used and had higher profits and levels of business capital. What's needed is skills development, but not the usual business and financial training, it turns out. It turns out that personal initiative and soft skills training is even more effective. It can build the ability of women-led businesses to be more innovative, competitive, and creative in solving problems. In Togo, a personal initiative training program that aimed to develop a more entrepreneurial mindset led to a boost, not only in innovation, but also in women-led businesses' profits. And finally, we need women's leadership. And Value for Her offers an opportunity to dispel the old assumptions around women's roles in agriculture or women's roles in business and help ensure that women-led agribusinesses are visible and profitable and therefore helping the continent build back better, more prepared, and more equal. Thank you. I'm standing and applauding your um, rally cry. And uh, we know that this is with uh, such experience and research and thoughtful, thoughtful um, uh, uh, commitment on your part. Uh, Jim, this is going to be hard for you to follow up. I know that you've been, um, you've been thanked already in my WhatsApp for, for being a valiant um, uh, representative of your gender. And we are for gender <laughs> inclusion. inclusion. I have to be honest. Um, Jim Barnhart is the assistant administrator at the U.S. Agency for International Development and the uh, at, at heading the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And Jim, I know that you have such support for um, uh, women in agriculture in the continent and Africa, and, and you've participated with us previously at the AGRF already. And as soon as you came on board this summer, 
Um, can you tell us just a little snapshot of what you see coming out uh, within USAID in, in, in the coming months as we all try and build back better and recover and find a new normal and not go back, as Vicky said, to the same old uh, biases? Over to you. No, thank, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And I, I appreciate you letting me onto the panel. Um, <clears throat> Congratulations mm -hmm. to to Agra and value for her, value value for her for her <laughs> um, and um, Sabdio. Um, congratulations on heading up the the gender and inclusiveness um, office at, at Agra um, and and thanks to CTA for for its work in putting this together and passing on to Agra. Look, I'm excited to be here. Sorry. Hello. I think we have a mute problem. <laughs> well, look, I, and I, I take a lot of, of, of everyone's time. So our um, IT team is going to mute whoever is not on mute. But you can go ahead, Jen. We all right, I'll, I'll try to jump in between between her sentences. Okay, um, go ahead, Jim. It's just like an African market. You got to just talk over the storm. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, I <laughs> think you, all right, good. So where was I? So anyway, congratulations to all concerned. I think that um, my previous two panelists um, on this panel hit some of the key issues, uh, support everything they say 100%, table thump that. Um, I was inspired by listening to, to Beatrice, Beatrice and Eva earlier, talking about their, their, their real life um, uh, experiences of being a, a woman entrepreneur. Look. Um, I've spent almost 40 years now in this business and in trying to do development around the world in different sectors. And it is mind boggling to me that we are still struggling to try to address gender equality across the world because it is the easiest thing that we could do to increase and transform countries around the world if we could open up a, um, access to women to credit, to training, um, and to business opportunities. And so, I have, in, in every post I've been at, where we've focused on gender issues, I, I always find it really difficult to, to comprehend anyone who resists this. I mean, this is the easiest thing that we could do to lift the lives of people around the world. And and, and Vicki and Nitty talked about what, what that means in terms of the family, what it means in communities when, when women's incomes improve, it affects the nutrition levels. Um, and from us, for, for we, where we are in, in the in USAID and for the Feed the Future program, we believe wholeheartedly that the best way to get at inequality around the world and inequities is agriculture-led growth in the, the least developed countries. We, it, figures show time and again that when you invest in agriculture and there's agriculture-led growth, income levels are much more standard and, and you see that across the board as opposed to other sectors where we see much, much more inequality. And so we are going to continue to put our emphasis behind ag-led growth within the Feed the Future um, global uh, U.S. government initiative and within our, our USAID programs as well. But also we're going to promote and, and really put our, our everything we have behind inclusive growth. And that has to be what we're talking about here. So um, you can count on us to remain um, firm allies in this. Um, the, and going back to the first panel and listening again to Eva and Beatrice talk about their experiences, um, it reinforced to me that we, again, we certainly in the in the, the development donor world need to do everything we can to get out of the way and let um, um, <laughs> let our, our our partners fix their own problems. They know what the issues are. They know how to address them. And so what I love about Value for Her is it allows for um, entrepreneurs um, in different parts of Africa to connect digitally and to solve their own issues. And to the, to the extent that we can be supportive and help facilitate that discussion, great. But we don't need to, I mean, we can allow that to happen and we can step out of the way and let um, Africa lead itself 
um, um, to into the next century. So, um, and that is really what the journey to self-reliance is all about, which is which is really what what USAID is all about. Um, in terms of certainly, Vicky had great. Um, I love the studies and the, some of the figures on on some of the effects of COVID. Um, let's agree that as, as difficult as this pandemic has been around the world in exacerbating inequality and showing where the gaps are, it's also an amazing opportunity. So let's look at where those opportunities are and seize on them. Um, some of that has to be in getting governments around the world um, to embrace a lot of the, 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 the legal regulatory barriers for women. And I think it, it, it's nothing like a crisis to force action, right? So let's make that a priority around the world and, and and allow I think if we just open the playing field to allow women to compete in the in the in the marketplace with men, um, we would just see an instant change. And so I will stop there, Vanessa. I've talked long enough. Um, but congratulations once again and um, back to you. Thank you so much, Jim, and uh, we appreciate your um, your your visionary uh, uh, perspective of Africa leading itself and solving its own problems. And and with that, um, I, I I really appreciate all of your remarks and contributions. I'd like to invite Dr. Ibrahim Kader and Dr. Agnes Kalibata to join us for the formal launch of this panel. And as we launch at the very end, we would like to invite all of our panelists and speakers and to join us uh, in, in, in celebrating this handover. Dr. Ibrahim Kader is, uh, of course, the uh, executive director of the CTA and will speak to us about the legacy that you have been documenting such a phenomenal um, run and supported by the European Union, uh, so many knowledge products and such a fantastic partner of Agris for such a long time. Thank you so much, Dr. Kader. And um, Dr. Kalibata, when she can, can turn on her video and join us. Please, over to you, Dr. Kader. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And uh, let me start by thanking the participants who have joined us in this meeting. Um, and of course, Agra for putting up such a fantastic show. Uh, really, as you mentioned, the word legacy, those who don't know would have perhaps come to the conclusion or be guessed that something is going to be shut down for to have a legacy or disappear. So CT, of course, is on its way to being closed as a center. Um, and again, thank you to all the panelists. I really enjoy listening to everyone. Uh, speak from different perspectives. When I was asked, or at least contemplating taking over in around January, February this year, because I, I, my mandate started in March, I, I asked myself, you know, what is going to be the main challenge, uh, given that this is going to be all about closing a center, which was only ready for closure, if I can put it that way. Uh, and I came to the conclusion really quickly that it's all about motivation. How am I going to motivate, first of all, myself, and then, of course, the colleagues and everyone. And then we, as we were strategizing, the idea of legacy came up. And we are not quite sure what to do with this, whether it's just about doing an inventory or really trying to see what happens to in terms of sustainability and so forth. So we. We started this work, and of course, we are announcing the closure of CTA, different strategic partners. Um, and we, we went around many, many partners, wrote really encouraging letters back, you know, mails. But then I, not too much, I didn't really know at the time, but I, I realized maybe two months into the process that AGRA was one of those organizations that was looking at CTA, not only feeling kind of sympathetic about our closure, but really interested in what we've been doing. And when I got to talk to uh, colleagues here at CTA, and then we arranged meetings with uh, Agra staff, it really became a big source of motivation. I mean, I really saying this uh, because that is exactly how, how it's been, because not only talking about specific legacy, but you were talking about the organization as a whole, how we could have actually been part of 
your, 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 your institution, just to make sure that what you are doing does not disappear. And that has been really very, very helpful, very, very encouraging. And also the discussion has been at all levels from the president, the vice presidents, yourself, Vanessa, um, directors, all really showing that enthusiasm. So thank you for that indirect support. Maybe you didn't know you were doing that, but it's really made colleagues here very happy to, you know, and a center like yours would think so much of CTA so positively. Um, after this process also, maybe just I share one lesson with, 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 the, with the audience here today, and that's about capacity building. I know it's been mentioned a few times. I mean, the way um, a few suggestions have been made today about how we can look at development, especially for Africa. And we've been pushed a lot, I mean, institutions to think so much about this impact around creating jobs, uh, uh, basically um, more food and all this, which are extremely important, income, income increase. Of course, that's important, but I think for Africa especially, building capacity should not be taken lightly. Because quite often the strongest capacities, at least when I was growing up there, are mostly with the sort of institutions that are set up from, from outside, you know, development aid and so on. If you are studying as students, you probably go to the uh, British Council Library to get the best books. That's just a simple example. But basically the actual institutions there have been often overlooked and maybe dismissed. I think capacity building is key. And what does that mean? I mean, to, to really make it useful because it's an investment in any, any field of work, you got to think, think about the design, how, you know, how, how, how is it designed? You still got to think about the theory of change so that there are clear benefits ahead, whether it's empowerment, whether it's to bring, to create social capital or uh, economic capital and so on. Innovation is key and the opportunities are huge today to innovate through ICT involving youth. Partnership is key, whether it's private public sector partnership, uh, just institutions that are capable to help. Think about sustainability because often capacity building starts within a project, but projects don't go on forever. So you got to see what can actually continue after the project stops. And of course, maintenance. Maintenance is something, if you come from Africa and live in Europe and look at the roads, you see how much money, especially I live in Holland, is spent every year to, main, to, to <laughs> refurbish, maintain roads. And you wonder, but what's wrong? You know, it looks fine. But you see eventually, if you live there many years, that there are benefits. Sometimes another tiny branch road is created and it makes a difference to traffic. So maintenance is something that is important. Now, you may be wondering, you know, when am I going to talk about value for her? Well, this list that I have uh, given you comes from looking at value for her closely. It's not the other way around. It's not like I have a list of criteria and I'm looking at the program or the project and the value for her connect. I looked at the value for her connect and the project as a whole because I've admired this project for quite a while for a simple reason. I mean, I've been at CTA for, for 20 plus years and I see a project, an initiative that within two years, even before it actually was launched, people were queuing to be part of it. So I've always thought there must be something about value for her. So, it's, you know, and I'm m and &E expert. So have a, have a closer look and see what, what's happening here. And I can see that even from the name, when you hear value for her, you don't actually ask beyond that about impact. It's value that's meant to be created. And it's very clear who should benefit. Uh, there's a strong IT component, our ICT component. There's innovation in terms of uh, youth. Uh, partnership is key. And of course, this project has been blessed with strong partnership up to this point between CTA, AWIF, and AWAN. Yeah, uh, I, I, I see this trio as uh, empowered women uh, because that is exactly what they are. When you see them in action, they have had meetings at CTA. And you know, they know exactly what they were trying to do. Um, social capital is being created because this is a business place. And when there was a bit of pressure from our funders that maybe we should in rush into allocating a certain legacy uh, intellectual assets, my main argument was if you stop 
this this platform from operating even for a week maybe the news just goes round people move on to other places because it's about people it's not just about uh, tools um and now of course where we are the issue of sustainability is, is come up which of course will require more investment uh the, the the system needs to be upgraded there should be new ideas injected into this and it's really a blessing that uh, agra is taking over and even more to my satisfaction that the the, the group of partners whether it's are with awan and some others will remain active in the process uh sabio will remain very active of course uh, that has been made clear from the earlier some of the earlier speakers so it's really like a, like a baby that we're handing over, maybe a child because it's about three years now. And um, of course, I painted the picture, and I believe in it, of a very healthy child. So you might say, Agra, Ibrahim, what are you giving us? It can only go wrong, maybe. But, it's not, but that's not the case. The child has opportunity to grow. There's improvement ahead. Um, so if I... I'm around and I see what is happening in two years. I don't expect to see the same product. So there be, I won't be able to judge you because you would have grown, you would have developed, you would have moved into another place. So don't feel like me saying that he's such a perfect child. Uh, it's, it's, it's a way to, to, to sort of put pressure on you. Let me put it that way. No pressure at all because I'm sure you can handle this very well and it's going to continue to grow and to develop. And again, let me really um, end here briefly by thanking uh, Sabdio in particular, because she also helped a lot with our work on legacy, not only for, for this product. In fact, this was not the, the main reason, but she helped really uh, to, to, to pull out, isolate, uh, classify, with working with some other colleagues here. What exactly is legacy in terms of intellectual legacy? And, and therefore, another lesson here, of course, is sometimes we should be celebrating some of these capacity building initiatives, not just when the project ends, so that people know about it, because it's often a lot of investment. And of course, I thank all the uh, the, the, um, the the other panelists today, and, and of course, uh, Agra above all. So I really look forward to within two and a half months remaining that we continue thank to, you so to thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Kader. I, I'm shaking your hand and and uh, and <laughs> clapping with uh, gratitude and appreciation for all of your contributions. Um, if I could invite Dr. Kalibata, uh, I believe she's online to join us and to make a few remarks from your perspective, Agnes, uh, for women in agriculture, for networks, for value for her, and for this important handover from CTA and this legacy, um, Dr. Kalibata. I think she's on mute. Hopefully you can unmute from where you're at, Agnes. I know she's not an easily accessible area. Uh, the organizer has to unmute Agnes. I'm hoping that some one of our organizers can help. She's still muted by an organizer. This seems to be a technical glitch here. Um, let's see if okay if Agnes can unmute herself. All right, I'm not sure how to help here. So with that, I'd like to invite all of our fantastic panelists to join. Oh, 
join us back on the screen and um, invite Ava, um, Beatrice with uh, Agribusiness Women's Network, Irene from AWEF, which is the Entrepreneurship Innovation, Dihi with UN Women, of course, Vicky, for those of you who don't know who's calling from Seattle at five o'clock in the morning, um, and Jim Barnhart from Washington, D.C., and Agnes hopefully is joining us spiritually, virtually, um, and also demonstrating the networking challenge in Africa. Uh, and we all are so pleased and, and so appreciative of all of your contributions and your fights wherever you are uh, for the women in agribusiness, women in Africa, women, rural women all over the continent working so hard to feed their families, to advance the education and, and progress in their communities, join in networks, build capacity, as you've said so well, Dr. Kader, build the institutions. And as Jim was saying, let Africa solve more and more problems itself. Taking that leadership and inspiring going forward as we go into the Food System Summit year and the challenges, not just of overcoming COVID, but also of building something better beyond what we all had imagined previously. Ava, I hope I can eat your fish and seafood sometime very soon, all the way in Kenya. I'm going to be holding out my hand and expecting delivery through the network. Um, and we have hundreds of questions which have come through as well. So we're looking forward and we'll send those questions off to all of you um, to join in. And after this session, we hope that all of you will distribute links and send out invitations to at least 15 women entrepreneurs. Uh, so that the 200 people that joined today can also generate another thousand women entrepreneurs joining on the platform and generating business all over Africa. So a big hand, round of applause and uh, congratulatory remarks and appreciation for all the hard work of CTA. We're so pleased that Agra is taking this over as a new home. And Sabdio for your vision and dedication building and transferring and growing this platform for which we're all so appreciative. So with this, we're going to wrap up the panel and wrap up this webinar and again, uh, show much appreciation for the leadership that Dr. Kalibata is also giving us to go forward and, and continue fighting the good fight as she has done for so many years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, for facilitating. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you.